Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us for this Legs Matter discussion this evening around understanding foot ulcers. I'm absolutely delighted to be in the presence of some of the UK's leading foot experts um, who are compassionate, knowledgeable and here tonight to share their knowledge and thoughts with you. So I will introduce our panel. Firstly, myself, my name is Debbie Sharman. I am a consultant podiatrist in diabetes. Uh, I work for Dorset Healthcare NHS Trust and I work within Bournemouth and Poole hospitals. So I'm delighted to introduce you to Professor Michael Edmonds. Uh, I'm a, a diabetologist uh, uh, working at King's College Hospital uh, with a special interest uh, in the foot. Uh, and uh, we, we've been working in the foot clinic now for 40 years to try and improve the outlook for people with diabetes. Thank you, Mike. And uh, Stephanie. Uh, good evening. My name is Stephanie Stanley. I'm a consultant podiatrist and clinical and professional lead for podiatry on the Isle of Wight. And I work primarily with people with diabetes. Thank you, Stephanie. And uh, Martin. Good evening. My name is Martin Fox. I'm a vascular podiatrist working in the NHS in Manchester with a, a long history of working with people with foot ulcers, both with and without diabetes. And in the last 10 years, working primarily in the community service where we uh, diagnose and manage people with peripheral arterial disease in partnership with our vascular teams and GPs. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. And Jane. Hi, my name's Jane Robbie. I'm a senior podiatrist at University Hospitals Birmingham NHS Trust, and I'm also a senior lecturer at Birmingham City University. Um, and I work... Can you hear? Are you all right, Debbie? Yes. Mm. Oh, sorry. Um, and I work um, in a, an outpatient clinic uh, in the hospital, and I work in um, the, the wards and the multidisciplinary team working predominantly with diabetes. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Christian. Hello, my name is Christian Pankhurst. I'm an orthotist and I work in Guy's and St Thomas's as well as King's College Hospitals in South East London. Um, as an orthotist, I am um, part of the multidisciplinary team in the foot and diabetes, where I complement the team um, with um, a difference in knowledge um, from our podiatry colleagues in that we have more of an engineering, material science and design background. Um, so we're able to bring that um, into helping our patients. Thank you all very much. And I do apologise for my um, difficulty sharing the screen. I'm hopefully uh, you're all now able to, uh, to see some slides up in front of you. So this is what we're hoping to cover for you this evening. We're going to talk about what a foot ulcer is and why it is important, what the consequences are of, of not treating correctly and how we do treat foot ulcers. So first of all, um, I'm going to ask Professor Edmonds to kindly uh, set the scene, please. Uh, thank you very much, Debbie. And good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. And in the next few minutes, I'm going to set the context in which uh, foot ulcers can develop and their complications. So there are three big problems that affect the foot in diabetes, which we call the diabetic foot. First, neuropathy. That's damage to the peripheral nerves, mainly from high blood sugar levels. And this leads to loss of sensation, numb feet. So the feet do not detect trauma, and this can lead to breaks in the skin and ulceration. The second problem is ischemia. And that is a reduction in blood supply uh, to the leg and to the foot, mainly from blockage of the arteries by atherosclerosis. And the third problem is infection, to which our diabetic patients are particularly susceptible. Now, we must try and look at the problems, these problems practically. And the next slide, Debbie, will show that we are 
we work with two main divisions of diabetic foot. That's the neuropathic foot, when neuropathy, neuro damage is predominant. And secondly, the neuro ischemic foot, where there is both neuropathy and ischemic ischemia. These feet go through various uh, stages in the natural history in a patient with diabetes. And the next slide uh, shows the sequence. So the foot can be initially normal and then become high risk. That's high risk for ulceration. Uh, third stage actually is the development of ulceration with then the onset in the fourth stage of infection. And then at the fifth stage, the infection can lead to what we call necrosis. That is uh, death of tissue in the foot. Now, to illustrate the problems uh, a little more clearly, uh, the next slide is going to show a series of pictures. Now, I warn you about this, and they're not meant to shock you at all, but they're meant to gently um, inform you uh, so that we can try and prevent the severe consequences. So if you look at the, the top part of the slide, that's the high risk foot. And you can see the neuropathic foot uh, the ball of the foot is particularly prominent there, and this is susceptible to high pressure from walking, uh, but the foot does not feel those high pressure because of the neuropathy. Moving to the right of the slide, that's, this is the neuroischemic foot now, where you can see a little dimple on the top. That's because the foot is swollen, because there is generalized ischemia and also ischemia to the heart. And you will notice perhaps uh, at the base of the first toe, uh, there's a little red area there. And that's because that foot has been in a tight shoe. Uh, and the tightness is not sensed because of the neuropathy. Now we'd like to keep all feet at this stage uh, free from ulcers, but unfortunately, we can't do that for everyone. The, the, the risk factors are so great that it's difficult to prevent ulcers in the whole population. So we see in the neuropathic foot, ulcers can develop on the sole of the foot. You can see that in the neuropathic. Uh, and I guess you'll notice the ulceration in the neuro ischemic is on the side of the foot at the base of the toe. And that's come from that red mark because uh, the, the foot was continually subjected to that pressure, uh, not sensed because of the neuropathy, and it leads to ulceration. Now we should be trying to heal those ulcers, uh, and we will talk about that in the later part of the um, seminar. The problem now is that 50% of ulcers can become infected, and they become infected by bacteria that are just lying on the skin in all of us. And when we don't have any breaks in the skin, the bacteria just live comfortably and don't do any damage. But when they can get through the skin, then they start to multiply and can cause problems. And if you look at the infection uh, slides, uh, uh, three lines down, you can see redness and that's erythema, that's inflammation, uh, which uh, is trying to restrain that infection. It's a sign of infection, uh, this erythema or redness. Now, we should be active, very active in treating this and trying to uh, basically clear the infection at this stage. But unfortunately, and this is the most important uh, part to take on board is that in diabetes, the bacteria can go on and cause clots in the vessels of the foot and the toes. And in forming clots, thrombosis, the technical name, uh, it, they, it will block blood supply to the skin and it will lead to what we call necrosis uh, as, as such. Uh, and this necrosis, uh, death of tissue, can spread through the foot if the infection is not controlled. Uh, so that's the sequence. 
Uh, and and the, the final thing I want to say is that this sequence can proceed quite quickly in some cases so that you can have a high risk foot at the top there on a Monday. You can have an ulcer on a Tuesday. You can develop infection on a Wednesday and you can have necrosis on a Thursday and with a risk possibly of losing part or all of the foot. So that's the scenario uh, which uh, is the context which I want you to be aware of. But don't worry, don't be afraid. There is a lot of help available to treat uh, these situations at every stage. And all of these problems uh, are preventable. So uh, we just want you to understand what the situation is so that you can get help quickly uh, and prevent this developing. So Debbie, I'll hand you back now uh, for, for Stephanie to carry on. Thank you, Professor Edmund. So Stephanie, uh, perhaps you would like to um, tell us what a foot ulcer is. Okay, thank you very much to both of you. Um, as you can see on the left-hand photograph, this is what we would call a neuropathic ulcer, or as um, Professor Edmonds was telling us about, which is on a load-bearing area on the foot. And you can see that's underneath what we would probably call the first MTPJ or the metatarsophalangeal joint. And that's the part of your foot where we normally would push off when we go to walk. And on the right-hand photograph, you can see what we would call a, more likely to be an ischemic ulcer. So that's the one that's more likely to be due to uh, poor blood supply or some impairment in your blood supply. And as a generalization, we would say that neuropathic ulcers are on load-bearing areas. So you will often see them on the bottom of the foot, on the bottom of the heel, or on the tips of the toes where you would claw to the floor. And the other ones, the ischemic ulcers, tend to be around what we call the periphery or the edges of the foot. And actually, if we're being honest, an ulcer is what we would say is a break in the contiguous surface of the skin. So you can get an ulcer in effect, a simple cut, but an ulcer generally, we tend to think of something that's a little bit more long standing or something that's a little bit more complex. Uh, next slide, please, Debbie. So what happens or what should you do if you were to get a foot ulcer? So what we will always say to everybody is, first of all, if you have noticed that you've got an ulcer, if you notice that something's weeping or is not the same as it has been on any other day, or you notice that there's maybe some discharge on your sock or on the floor or anything like that, we say, please carefully clean the ulcer with water or a simple thing. We ask you not to put lots of sort of chemicals or anything like that on it to clean it, but to simply clean it with water and put a very simple dry dressing on it. Please don't add anything that's likely to stick. And ideally, we need you to contact your local foot protection team. Now, most areas in the country would have this in place and hopefully you would be aware of who to contact. If you don't know who they are, please contact your podiatry team or even your GP practice immediately. And um, one of the things we'd all like to emphasize to you, if you are told or you, can, you can't see anybody, then you should ask who should you see in, instead? Please try not to get fobbed off. Please try to ensure that you know who you can go to if you have any concerns. And don't hesitate to tell them that you think you've got an ulcer and explain that it is causing you problems. So the important thing is to make sure that you're seeking assistance. If you haven't been able to see anybody or can't get through to anybody, we would recommend that you call 111 for advice, explaining what other conditions you've got, how long you've had the ulcer, the problems you're having, and what you think needs to happen. But still in the interim, still keep trying to contact the local teams. And as Professor Edmonds was telling us, time is of the essence when treating foot ulcers. It's really important to note that things can escalate, not always, but things can escalate very quickly. So it's really important to seek help as soon as possible. Next slide, please. So we don't talk about money as such, but I think it's always very important to understand the significance and the consequences for the NHS and for ourselves um, of having an ulcer. Now I'm going to ask for a little bit of forgiveness here because we're going to talk about the cost of diabetic foot ulcers or DFUs as we would call them. 
And we're going to just talk about England because that's where, unfortunately, or fortunately, most of us on the panel actually work. So the cost of caring for people or patients with diabetic foot ulcers in England alone is estimated at roughly £837 million a year. Now, that for me, I think, is an astronomical amount of money. And it is equal to about one pound in every 125 spent by NHS England, which is a very big ask when you think about how expensive certain treatments are. Look. And also about 6,000 people with a diagnosis of diabetes have either a leg, foot or toe amputation each year. And we know, as, as Professor Edmonds was telling us, the prognosis for people with diabetes who have amputation is poor and up to 55% of people can be expected to die within five years of the operation. And sadly, as I think we're going to come on to later, this actually is a similar or worse survival rate than many common types of cancer. Aside from all of that, aside from the money and all the other things, actually having a diabetic foot ulcer or an ulcer can affect your quality of life. It may mean you may not be able to go swimming or dancing. It may mean you may not be able to go out for walks with your friends or take the dog out for a walk. It may mean that you're limited to be able to go out and see your friends or you feel you don't want to go out and see your friends. And this has a very large devastating impact on, on yourselves, on your families, and actually on the health and social care system. Because if you were once dependent and don't feel you're able to go out, then it's that much harder for you to actually go out and about and do the things that you love and enjoy. And even something as simple as going shopping or doing your own jobs and messages. Next slide, please. Bear with me, I'm just having some problems moving on to the next slide. There we go. Thank That's you, fine. Steph. Um, Martin, can we perhaps ask you to tell us a little bit more about um, the consequences of, of not treating correctly? Thanks, Debbie. Um, Steph alluded there to some of the really scary things to do with foot ulcers, um, which is the idea of amputations and mortality or early death. And the good news is that lots can be done about this. But in order to even put those things in context, we need to think about raising awareness of people who've got foot ulcers um, so that and particularly foot ulcers that are complicated by long term conditions such as diabetes or peripheral vascular disease, arterial disease, or rheumatoid arthritis, for example. And we know that people with these long-term conditions with foot ulcers sometimes have got quite poor outlooks. And yet there's an awful lot of fear sometimes about amputation. And yet we know that most people with foot ulcers won't have an amputation. So we have to try and weed out those that do by assessing and staging and triaging people into the most appropriate care. But we need to talk about these serious issues much more. And I'm particularly involved in this campaign from a few years ago, where we want to get some awareness going. Everybody knows, for example, that heart attacks can cause early death. And everybody knows that cancer can cause early death. But both of those conditions are also survivable with the right treatment at the right time. And with foot ulcers, it's just the same. Um, if it's not managed well, then it can lead to amputation in the limb. And if it's not managed well over a period of years and the risk factors that sit behind why you got a foot ulcer in the first place, then we can have people that are losing years of life. And we need to get that out there so that people with foot ulcers and the people that are around them, the carers, the GPs, the practice nurses, the podiatrists, um, and all the people that might have an input are aware of these issues to ensure that as soon as somebody gets a foot ulcer, they receive the right type of assessment at the right time. And then they receive the right type of interventions for um, dealing with it to promote survival of the limb and survival of the person with quality of life and healing thrown into the equation. So these posters were, were something we developed where, where we talked about your foot ulcer being an early warning system, particularly if you have diabetes, it can be as serious if you get a foot ulcer as having cancer and Steph alluded to that. And we know, for example, that people with uh, lower limb complications such as ulcers or arterial disease or neuropathic ulcers or Charcot foot, which is where the bones of the foot go very mushy, a complication of diabetes and nerve damage, that the outlook for those people can be quite poor when you look at the five-year survival versus mortality rates. And 
um, people with breast cancer, for example, have got a much better outlook than people with foot ulcers for surviving. And yet people with lung cancer have got a much worse outlook. So it's in there in the mix. And we know that if we can uh, get people to be more aware of this, that we can then hopefully inspire them to seek the right treatment at the right time. And we also know that if we get that treatment in a timely way, survival and reduction of associated heart attacks, strokes and amputation can be avoided. But we've all got to work together on this. Um, so the next slide, please, please, Debbie. So the good news, and there is good news because it's heavy stuff, that isn't it? But the good news is that we know from the evidence and the literature that's built up over the last 40 years or so that seeking specialist lower limb and foot ulcer attention at the right time, so as soon as the problem occurs on day one, and day one is a really important day because day one for a break in the skin for somebody with uh, a condition such as diabetes, arterial disease, or rheumatoid arthritis needs to be a day that they take action on. And finding that way into your local foot protection team and your multidisciplinary foot ulcer management team is the thing to do. Now, that might be via your GP, your practice nurse, your podiatrist, your leg ulcer nurse, your tissue viability nurse. But there's a way in to get rapid access in most places in, in the UK, in the NHS, for the right people at the right time you may be having treatment for foot problems privately and that's absolutely fine but when you develop an ulcer your private practitioner needs to work in partnership with the nhs to get you to the the layer of skills assessments and then treatments that we can offer as part of the nhs package and the key thing is that if we get that if we get that in place for somebody with a new foot ulcer we can really help to heal those ulcers quickly and reduce the long-term implications for things like uh, worsening vascular disease, heart attack, strokes, amputation, and early death. So the MD team is the gold standard, the multidisciplinary team. And most areas of the UK will either have a specialist foot protection team or a, a, a multidisciplinary hospital team that deals with the complexity of ulcers uh, that are um, uh, complicated by long-term conditions. And in particular, diabetes has led the way on this in the last 20 years. But we know that we also need to deal with people who haven't got diabetes and the foot protection teams and the tissue viability teams are the first port of call for this and they link really well usually with their local vascular teams and through that partnership work in that collaboration between community and hospital teams um, with people with more complex and urgent footholes has been rushed through the system quickly we can get you to the point where you get the right treatment for infection for lack of circulation to the foot ulcer and for pressure relief, uh, working with people like Christian, the orthotist in the hospital, where we can really reduce the pressure on the wounds to allow full healing. So it's all about acting on day one to get to the right team locally at the right time. And that can reduce these risks of more complications. We also know from the evidence that if we then put in place with GPs and the practices in primary care, a gold standard cardiovascular management plan for people with foot ulcers and long-term cardiovascular vascular type problems, which again is diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and peripheral arterial disease, and it may, may be complicated by things like heart disease as well. Um, they, if we get the right medicines in place for people, uh, the team in Edinburgh has shown that they can promote survival rates. And Steph talked about the, the average survival rate of somebody with a diabetes-related foot ulcer uh, of being about 50% at five years. So that's five out of 10 people alive at five years, five out of 10 people dead. In Edinburgh, when they put in place gold standard medicines at the point where the foot ulcers were diagnosed, they increased their survival rate to seven out of 10 people at five years. And that benefit was maintained over time. So medicines, as well as for cardiovascular medicines, as well as best treatment for foot ulcers in the limb can really promote life and limbs. And we talk about the partnership of life and limbs. So there's the best treatment for the foot ulcer needed, first of all, to manage the risk and the best assessment. We need to know how deep is that ulcer how infected is that ulcer and how much uh, circulation problem might be lying behind that ulcer in the limb. So the assessments for that is absolutely crucial in the first days and weeks. We then need early treatment, not waiting two or four or six weeks until the ulcer deteriorates, but early intervention by the best, most expert team you can get into locally 
lifestyle modifications play a key role still at this point. We know that people who, for example, give up smoking and when they develop serious complications in the lower limb will uh, maintain that limb and have less chance of amputation. So smoking, even if you've been smoking for 20, 30 years, if you stop smoking, switching perhaps to an e-cigarette as a harm reducing intervention or stopping completely tobacco or e-cigarette, you're likely to improve your risk for losing the limb at that point. So it's never too late. That's a key thing. And also getting people into um, a safe, proactive cardiovascular type exercise when they develop foot ulcers, Not not in the acute phase when we need to rest that foot and get things under control but as the weeks and the months go on getting somebody into a cardiovascular type rehab exercise program alongside the best medicines a long time alongside the limb management can really change the long-term outcome for people and the potential for um, healing reduced heart attacks reduced strokes reduced hospitalization so it's all about that combination of bringing the limb management together and the cardiovascular risk management. It's a partnership between you, the patient, your GP and practice nurse, the specialist uh, foot ulcer, lower limb teams, and the specialist multidisciplinary teams in the hospital, diabetes or vascular to name but two. So that's the secret to getting things under control and getting things healed. Thank you, Martin. Before we move on, I wonder you mentioned the right medicines there. I wonder, can you maybe just just briefly tell us uh, what sort of medicines you, uh, we're we're talking about here? Yeah, the, the good news is these medicines are common and easily available and well known. So the main medicines for people with a diabetes related foot ulcer um, and, 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 and perhaps underlying arterial disease is to focus in on the diabetes medicines, first of all, to optimize diabetes control if that's an issue. If diabetes isn't an issue, we're usually focus, focusing in on medicines for blood pressure and cholesterol. So your blood pressure tablets, your statins, and we need to move people who are on low dose blood pressure, where the blood pressure might not be optimally managed to higher dose tablets or a different regime. So the blood pressure is really tightly controlled. And a good blood pressure control, for example, for somebody with a foot ulcer will be anything under 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. So if your blood pressures are coasting at 160 over, over, over 95, for example, on average, when you check them at home, that needs to come down. So it might mean a medicine's change with your blood pressure medicines. Cholesterol tablets, statins, although sometimes getting a bit of bad press, they're really important with people with diabetic foot ulcers, and they're also really important for people with peripheral arterial disease. So high dose statins, and we're usually talking something like a torvastatin, and 80 milligrams rather than 20 or 40 milligrams will be the optimized dose. And we also often use um, blood thinning tablets for people with uh, peripheral arterial disease in particular and foot ulcers. And so you're thinking of things like aspirin is the traditional one, 75 milligram aspirin. And that, that got switched over to 75 milligrams of clopidogrel is the most recent regime. So um, 75 milligram clopidogrel and a 80 milligram statin, for example, will be a prime dose of medicines to help with the cardiovascular risk management around your ulcer management. And now we've got a new medicine on the market called Rivaroc. And Rivaroxaban has been shown to have benefits both for cardiovascular outcomes and, importantly, amputation outcomes. So some teams now are starting to look at managing people on a combination of Rivaroxaban, aspirin and statin for their diabetes-related foot ulcers or their arterial disease in the lower limb. Thank you, Martin. So, um, Steph, I'm going to ask you now. To Martin's covered some of the the management of, of foot ulcers, both both for people with diabetes and and without diabetes. Um, and perhaps you'd like to tell us a little bit more about what somebody might expect when they attend uh, their foot ulcer clinic. Lovely. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, yes, thank you to Martin as well because he's covered some of the points that we're going to be looking at now. So, when you attend probably for the first time or even on a follow-up appointment for your foot ulcer. These are things that the team will be doing with you. They'll be looking at the circulation in your feet and listening to your pulses using either using a Doppler or most often they'll actually palpate your pulses using their fingers. Um, they'll also be using something that you can see in the picture is what we call a monofilament. Now a monofilament is a calibrated piece of effect, in effect plastic which gives you 10 grams of pressure. And what we will be looking for there is where on probably five or 10 points on the foot, whether or not you can feel any pressure. And that's looking to see what your sensations like. So we're then looking 
to see what your risk is. And we'll be able to tell that from being able to say, if you cannot feel all the areas on your foot and your circulation is impaired, then you would be considered to be more at risk of having extra problems with your foot or feet. Um, as Martin very sensibly said, we would check on all of your medications. Now, sometimes when people come to have their foot ulcers checked, they omit to tell us, not because they're being funny, but they omit to tell us all the medications they take. And that's sometimes because they think, well, I've come from my foot. How is that going to affect it? I take a medicine for my head or for my shoulders. But obviously, as Martin was saying, a lot of the medications that you are on are incredibly important for the health of your feet. So we're looking at the blood pressure tablets, the statins. We're looking at any of the blood thinners. And we're also looking for drugs that may change how your feet function, maybe some of the rheumatoid drugs or even some of your diabetes drugs. We'll ask you about what has happened. It's really important for us to know if this is something that you maybe felt, maybe this is something that you suddenly discovered one day, maybe it's something you discovered, unfortunately, something like a pin tack or a drawing pin or a piece of Lego in your shoe. Um, and so we can actually pinpoint what has actually happened to your foot. And most areas will actually then take a series of photographs. We'll photograph you on your first time you've been. And we will then photograph you every single time you come in because we need to track your progress. And also we ask you if you're willing to take a photograph on your own mobile phones as well, because it's useful for you to be able to track and sometimes for you to be able to show your family so you can get engagement from them because it's important for you to be able to rest and elevate your fit if um, necessary to allow the ulcer to heal. Next slide, please, Debbie. Um, you may also be asked to go and have an x-ray of your foot. Now, the reason we do this is because we need to see whether there's any infection perhaps in your bone, but also to see maybe you've broken a bone or perhaps maybe you've got a foreign object in there. We're also looking to see whether or not there's been any movement within the bones. And as we were chatting about earlier, um, we were chatting about a thing called charcoal foot. So it may be that perhaps part of your bone structure within your foot has collapsed. So we're checking to see if that's there. We'll also ask you to have blood tests. Now the blood tests will be checking for all the things that Martin and Prof Edmonds were talking about with your um, levels to do with your static, whether or not you've got cholesterol that's too high, whether or not you've got glucose that's too high, whether or not the infection markers in your blood are high. We'll also be looking at how well your liver and your kidneys are working because we may want to put you onto antibiotics and we need to see how well the rest of your body would cope with that. You will have treatment on that first appointment um, and we will use, put a dressing on your feet and we'll also then use something to offload the ulcer, which Christian will come on to. And we, you may have an alternative shoe or something to wear, which keeps the pressure off. And then you will obviously come back regularly until the ulcer is in remission. And one of the things we need to also say is that obviously as podiatrists, we use scalpels and we use blades in effect to remove some of the dead skin on your foot. So what we need to say to you is in a lot of these instances, we take away some dead skin that overlies the ulcer. So you might come in with a tiny little mark and go out with a big hole but that's actually because we've taken away the bad skin that's on the surface of the ulcer. So in that instance, blood is good. So please don't panic when you uh, maybe see some blood on your dressing. That would be expected in this instance. And I think I'm handing over to Christian now. Thank you, Steph. Um, uh, Christian, so I'll, I'll hand over to you. And, and actually, uh, a question that has just been asked is how to prevent foot ulcers. And I I'm sure you're probably going to uh, touch on this um, in, in your uh, talk over the next few slides. So thank you. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, well, one of the main things that we provide in the orthotics department is advice on the correct footwear, which people need to wear. Um, Professor Edmonds alluded in one of his slides um, about um, skin damage happening because people or the person in question um, was wearing footwear, which was slightly too tight, um, which caused some damage. And so there are lots of functions um, which footwear actually provides, which um, we all need to be aware of. Um, the primary um, function which we uh, need to consider is um, that we're wanting to reduce the risk um, of um, the foot breaking down due to pressure. And so we want to protect skin which is at risk as much as possible to keep it intact. We want to provide a degree of shock absorption when people are walking, as well as um, provide enough space and depth to accommodate 
any pressure redistribution devices such as an insole, which um, we may need to provide to somebody. Um, we need to accommodate any deformities which might be present, whether they're um, mild or severe deformities, and they could be structural in terms of the bone structure, or there could be a mechanical deformity if someone's um, having difficulty with instability. Um, we need to um, ensure that there is adequate stability, which is provided when people are standing and they're walking around. And we want to limit any pathological movements, um, which may be the cause of any damage which can occur. We want to reduce pain if pain is present. Um, and we also, and this is um, a big thing, um, if we're providing any footwear, um, is we want to be cosmetically appealing um, because there is a big um, psychological burden to um, footwear. Um, and if we're needing to provide footwear to somebody, we need to make sure that it is something which they are wanting to wear and that they are happy to wear, happy to be seen wearing. Um, so when it comes to footwear, even if we're just advising people on what to look for, um, if we don't need to accommodate um, any structural deformities, um, we want to make sure that there is a deep enough toe box, which is the front section um, ab above the toes, um, so that we can accommodate um, all the tops of people's toes, especially if there's any clawing or if the toes are slightly retracted at all. And we need to accommodate any insoles which might be present. There needs to be a very stable um, hindquarter at the back of the shoe so that we can hold on to the um, uh, hind foot and the heel um, to maintain a good foot position. And we need to have a modest pitch, the pitch being the difference between the heel height and the sole height. Um, and so we need to go for about one and a half centimeter difference of the heel being higher than the sole. Um, if it's any higher than that, then um, we know through research that there's increased pressure, which is then applied onto the forefoot. And if we go too much lower than that, then there's increased pressure at the hind foot and we have balance problems. As much as possible, there needs to be a seamless construction. So we're avoiding any seams or any stitching areas um, because those will always be the last areas to, uh, to stretch. And there needs to be a good fastening section so that we can hold someone securely against the back of the shoe to prevent any rubbing which can occur during the course of the day, which can lead to friction forces and shear, which can break um, down the skin. Um, we also need to make sure that the footwear is of adequate um, size, shape and width. And we can see in the bottom right of the screen there, um, the, the image just slightly towards the left um, shows somebody who's wearing a shoe which is too tight for them. People we know who have um, sensory changes due to um, neurop neuropathy changes um, as a result of diabetes um, can have that reduction in sensation. And so people might not realize if a shoe is too small for them, or it might be that having a shoe which is too tight gives them some form of um, feedback. Um, so they have that proprioceptive mechanism happening, uh, but we need to then help people with education to make sure that we're wearing shoes of the right size to keep the skin intact as much as possible. So if we're able to move on to the next slide, please, Debbie. I will. Christian, just before we do, um, somebody's asked the question as to whether trainers are good for people with diabetes. Trainers are a very good option for people. Um, there's often in trainers, there's a flatbed inlay which can be taken out and withdrawn, and that can easily be replaced. It gives us some space if we need to place any insoles inside to get some accommodation, depending on um, how, how thick the insole is and, and what it's needing to actually provide in terms of um, any structural support or function. Um, but trainers do have a very nice rocker sole to them, so they can aid people in that initial um, um, contact which is made as well as helping people through that terminal point um, when they're coming forwards and coming off the foot but it also provides a lot of shock absorption as well so trainers are very good um, but please make sure that um, you don't go for some which are, um, have too many seams on them uh, because that as I say will always be the last place to stretch. Thank you. Um, now if we're um, coming on to the importance of offloading the International Working Group for the Foot and Diabetes um, has stated that once an ulcer has formed, healing may chronically be delayed if the area is not effectively offloaded. And by offloading, um, we need to um, consider any form of pressure redistribution modality. And the aim of that really is largely mechanical um, because we aim to arrest any destructive forces uh, uh, or tissue damaging forces, which may be occurring to the foot and ankle. And we want to maintain alignment um, as much as possible to the joint structures and protect the joint structures as much as possible in all planes of movement. And you can see here that there is a myriad of options which are available 
um, to the multidisciplinary team and to provide some form of offloading and immobilization to somebody. The total contact cast um, being regarded as the gold standard, um, as we see that we've got through a lot of different studies, a lot of very, very good results in terms of healing rates, in terms of um, degrees of um, um, immobilizing, which can be offered, but the total contact cast often comes out on top. Um, but there are other options available depending on how somebody's presenting. Um, we know that the majority of wounds will heal, provided that there is adequate blood flow. Um, and so we need to work with our vascular colleagues if we need to um, try and get reinstation of um, uh, good perfusion to the foot, that there's adequate pressure relief and that there's no microbiological burden. So that's working to try and get any antibiotics present if there are any forms of infections. And um, when we are prevent, uh, presented with any form of acute foot issue, it's working so that we can do a good assessment of the individual, an assessment of the area where the damage is present, and knowing the requirements of um, each individual. Um, so knowing what they can manage, um, both physically and psychologically, knowing the demands of the activities of their daily living, and then that will help us to get the appropriate modality of offloading, which we can then employ um, for all of our patients. So when we talk about offloading, it's not just the mechanical and the pressure offloading we need to consider. We also need to consider the psychological offloading. We know that there is a good psychological burden for a lot of people just living um, with a diagnosis of diabetes, but we see through literature that that um, more than doubles if there are any secondary complications um, which happen, especially in the case of ulcerations or Charcot's osteoarthropathy. Um, so if we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. And so when an orthotist gets involved um, within um, King's College Hospital and Guy's and St. Thomas's, um, we're able to be involved um, in all aspects. So um, we can be included in the preventive um, stage. So this is before anybody has um, developed their first foot ulceration or any problems with their feet. Um, we have direct access referrals from GPs as well as community teams and any healthcare professional. Um, so if there are concerns that somebody may be at risk of developing any foot problems, um, um, so I think we're talking a little bit later on about the different screening processes. Um, so if someone's at a moderate risk, then um, people can be referred directly into us and we can either provide advice on um, uh, the correct footwear or we can provide preventative means with um, appropriate insoles or any other cheap um, type of offloading. We do get involved, we work with our um, acute podiatry colleagues very often um, if we're trying to help with the treatment um, of a wound or um, any particular issue. Um, otherwise, it could be Charcot's osteoarthropathy. And then when it comes to managing against recurrence, we're wanting to keep people healed for as long as possible once an ulcer or a Charcot um, joint has healed. And so that involves a lot of close working with the patients as well as members of the multidisciplinary team um, so that we can get the right um, orthosis at the right time for the right patient um, and maintain that as long as possible so that we can keep the patient healed, we can keep people ulcer free and we can reduce the risk of any infection and any further damage from occurring. Lovely, thank you so much, uh, Christian. So. Um, Jane, I'm going to um, ask you now to, to tell us a, a little bit about uh, ACT Now. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. And thank you to uh, my previous uh, speakers for that really comprehensive um, uh, talk through um, for problems in diabetes. So what I'm going to do now for the next um, couple of minutes is to just talk you through what you can actually do positively for yourself. So we've talked a lot about what's, what can go wrong and, and how we would treat problems and what medicines you might take. But how do you know if you've got a problem? How do you know what's serious enough to warrant seeing somebody to, to look at that problem for you? So this simple six stage assessment tool called ACT Now was devised by a multi-professional panel um, of uh, experts in uh, the foot and diabetes and also in consultation with somebody with diabetes and it was designed to be simple and easy to use and logical for people uh, either with diabetes, their carers, members of the public um, or other healthcare professionals who maybe weren't familiar with the, with the foot and diabetes 
And basically what it talks you through is, is what, what to look out for. So A is for any accident or trauma in the leg or foot. The C is for any change in temperature or color or shape in the leg or foot. And T is for any temperature difference between the two feet. N is for any new pain, whether it's localized or generalized in the foot, whether it changes at all, um, whether it has any um, sort of specific onset. The O is for any oozing or exudate coming from a wound or coming through the skin or maybe from around the nails or in between the toes. Does that, does that exudate have any consistency? You know, is it, is it thin and watery or is it more thicker um, and, and uh, maybe more gelatinous in, in, content, in content? And does it have any smell associated with it? And then the W is for, is for the actual wound. Is there any wound present? Can you see any breaks in the skin? Are there any splits or cracks? Are there any um, areas in between the toes or maybe any areas around the nail where there's um, any uh, inflammation or, or indeed an open wound present? And this not only gives us a six stage assessment tool, but also it gives you permission to act now. If you have one or more of the, any of these signs uh, that I've just talked through, you should be looking to um, seek the advice of a, a healthcare professional. Now that might be your, gen, uh, your GP, it might be your community podiatrist if you have one, it might be your hospital department if you attend a hospital department, it might be that you phone 111 as one of my previous speakers mentioned, it might be if you thought it was serious enough or you were out of hours that you go to a and &E department or you go to a walk-in center. But some, somebody needs to have a look at that foot because as Professor Edmund said at the beginning, sometimes you don't have the luxury of time. And if you develop infection, infection can be very devastating. So if you have any of these, act now. Can I have the next slide, please? And, and these are the red flags. These are the things that you really should be getting absolutely urgent treatment for. So these include any purulent discharge, so any pus or any sort of smelly exudate coming from a, from a wound. Any cellulitis, this is this redness that you can see on this photograph. You can see this redness around that puncture wound at the, at the side of this foot. Um, that's called cellulitis. So We've already mentioned the redness, but also swelling. You can see that this foot looks quite swollen. It looks quite like it should be quite sore. It looks like it will be warm. So we're looking for any heat in the toe or foot. Although you need to be aware that if you have this damage to the, any damage to the nerve supply, so the neuropathy that um, my previous speakers talked about. So if you, if you are having any sort of numbness or changes of sensation in the feet, these classical signs of infection might be diminished or might be absent. So you can't rely on feeling any pain or feeling any discomfort. You need to do a visual check or a, or a check with your hands to, to feel for any temperature differences or anything like that. And if you feel or, or sense that there's any problems, if you have any of these red flags, you should act now and get advice. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. So Professor Edmonds, I'm just going to ask you to um, tell us a little bit about the treatment of infection, please. Thanks, Debbie. So the constituent of infection is that we have bacteria multiplying uh, and causing infection. The bacteria secrete enzymes uh, and fluids which will destroy the tissue and also promote, as I mentioned, clot and thrombosis. So we've got to stop these bacteria in their tracks and uh, we've got to be prompt and aggressive. You know, it's an enemy to the foot and it's an enemy that never sleeps. So we have first of all got to take antibiotics, prescribe antibiotics. Now, in the initial circumstance, uh, it's difficult to know which particular bacteria are causing this infection. And when you do get to your healthcare professional and they 
what we call deprive the ulcer, take away the tissue around it, the sloughy tissue, uh, they would probably do what we call a, a wound swab, that is a swab, or, or even better, take some tissue, a small amount of tissue uh, from the foot and send it off to the microbiology laboratory. And uh, the lab can then grow these bacteria and should within two days have the answer. But initially, uh, you are usually given an antibiotic which might cover several uh, organisms or bacteria. Now, you can take this orally if it's a mild infection. Um, but if it's a very severe infection and the uh, infection is making you ill, uh, it may be that you need antibiotics through the veins, intravenous. Now, this is usually given in hospital, but there are some, uh, uh, arrangements for this to be given at home through cannula, uh, through the um, district nurses and other uh, outpatient antibiotic teams. Uh, so it's important, and if you're prescribed the oral antibiotics, uh, Obviously, you will discuss with the prescriber whether you're allergic to a, a, a certain antibiotics or penicillin. Uh, so those will be uh, avoided. But it's very important to take them regularly and not miss a dose and to continue to the end of the course. But two or three days later, you should be much better. Uh, but uh, it, it, you, one still needs to check up on the result of the swab if it's taken. So uh, if your appointment's not for another week, then you could phone your healthcare professional, ask for the result and say, am I on the right antibiotic? Um, and that will give you some reassurance. In the meantime, you should rest. Uh, that helps the foot and the leg to fight infection and to take pressure off the foot. Uh, that's with offloading. Um, that, that I, I ideally uh, getting off the foot for the acute stage for the first 24 hours. Now, the foot may need a, an x-ray and a, a, we've discussed that before. That's to look uh, to see whether there is a bone involvement. Uh, the bones in the foot are very near the skin and uh, infection can go very quickly to the bone and that determines possibly a, a specific antibiotic, or you may have what's called an MRI. That stands for magnetic resonance imaging. And it's a basically a machine that uses strong magnetic fields and radio waves to form images of the bone and soft tissues and helps your um, healthcare professional see whether there's really early signs of infection uh, in the foot. Blood tests may be done to help the, the professional in the diagnosis. Uh, when you have infection, you have inflammation. The response of the body is inflammation. Uh, that's a form of a repair response. And there are certain uh, chemicals in the body. Uh, one is called C-reactive protein, CRP. That's just to tell you, just in case it's mentioned in your consultation. And that can go up in response to infection. Uh, and when it starts to coming down, we know that we are on top of the infection as such. So, and, and, and also a, a white blood test uh, may also uh, be done. Uh, you may have a fever, but you, you, you might not necessarily have a fever. And just to stress this, uh, for you as people with diabetes to know that you can have quite severe infections, but not have a fever. So if you take your temperature at home and you've got what you think is a nasty foot and the temperature is normal, don't be put off going to the professional and saying, I think I've got uh, an, an infection uh, because in diabetes, the fever is often not present. It's very important to control the diabetes. Uh, as we say, bacteria like sugar, but it, deeply, it, it's, we want the white cells who attack the bacteria to work as properly as possible. And they don't work so well if the blood sugar is high. 
So the good control of the diabetes and also be aware that infection of its own accord can put up the sugar. It makes you resistant to insulin. You, now you may be taking insulin by injections and it will make you resistant to those, or it may make you resistant to your own insulin, which the body is producing. So you may need to increase your uh, blood, uh, it, your tablets or your, or your insulin. And finally, uh, and, and this is again for you just to be aware of the issue. If the infection has taken a hold and is causing some destruction of tissues uh, and the antibiotics are not working 100%, they can't wall off that infection, infection is still spreading, it may be that you will have to have a, 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 a an operation, it's uh, not a major operation, but it's an operation to remove the infected tissue that is there uh, so that the foot can uh, respond better to the antibiotics. Uh, and uh, please don't be worried about that. Um, it, it's often a, a very good operation to help speed up the recovery. So, but I, I stress again and again, if you feel you've got uh, or, or you won't feel it, sorry, in a way, but if you think you've got an infection, please get help as soon as possible. It's much easier to treat an early infection rather than a late infection. And please don't be shy, have confidence and say, I think I've got an infection, it's serious, and I need uh, assistance and help. Thank you very much, Mike. So we're just coming up to the, the last couple of minutes now. We have been trying to answer all of your questions in, in the chat as they've been coming through. So Jane, in the last couple of minutes, perhaps you'd just like to quickly take us through the, the last two slides. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, we've heard about what can go wrong. So these are a few, a couple of positive slides with your final take home messages um, from this from this presentation. So you should, as people with diabetes, be having um, annual foot checks, but either with your GP, your practice nurse, your podiatrist. But somebody should be checking your feet um, annually to make sure that you have no uh, no um, risk risk problems with your feet. And they should be removing both of your shoes and socks testing your foot for the sensation using these special pieces of kit called a monofilament or um, a tuning fork um, or, or doing another test called an Ipswich touch test that um, we haven't got time to go into, but um, you, you might have that done with you where people just touch your feet and see if you can feel it. You should have your pulses checked um, to make sure that your blood supply is adequate and, and, um, uh, um, uh, and uh, your blood flow is, is functioning normally. You should have an inspection for any deformity or discoloration and any, the presence of any callus that might uh, require some uh, podiatry intervention. You shouldn't be uh, being advised to treat that yourself. Um, we need to check for any signs of ulceration or any previous ulceration um, and inspect your footwear. And then once we've done all of that, we need to tell you how to look after your feet and to give you any written or verbal information. And you might be given leaflets or you might be given directions to a, to a website if that's, if that's appropriate. Um, and, and giving positive advice about how to look after your feet. And we should be telling you what your risk status is. So whether your feet are at risk or high risk and what, you, what that means for you and what you need to do. And then you should be given uh, um, advice about what to look out for. So referring back to that Act Now checklist that I showed you earlier on and be given emergency numbers um, of people to contact should you have a problem. Um, because when you have a problem, you haven't got time to hang about. You need it. You need emergency numbers to contact, um, and you should be given that either in written or verbal form. Can we have the next slide, please. And again, the, the, the final key message: um, as as people with diabetes, or carers of people with diabetes, or healthcare professionals, um, this this is the advice that I would be giving to um, to people that I come into contact with. You need to check your feet every day and look for anything that's not normal for you. You know what your feet normally look like, and they may not look like the, the feet in a, in a magazine or, or, or your, your friend's feet or your partner's feet, but they're your feet and you know what they look like. And so check them for anything that looks, uh, that looks uh, like it's not normal. 
be aware of any loss of sensation and, the ability, and your ability to feel particularly pain or discomfort and that this may not be ultimately reliable if you're having some problems with the nerve supply. Check for any discoloration, any bruising, any changes in colour between the two feet or within the foot itself and look for any changes in shape in your, in your foot. Never use corn plasters um, or um, any uh, blades or anything like uh, chemicals on your feet because of the risk of it doing damage to the healthy skin as well as to the skin that you're wanting to, to the, the corn plaster or the blade to treat. And be aware of, any, of using files or anything like that on your feet, any of these uh, great cheese grater type devices as well because the risk is you can rub off more than just the, the, the hard skin. Make sure you know how to cut your toenails and that you cut your toenails appropriately. And there's lots of advice that you can, that you can um, receive via your podiatry team or um, via your um, GP about how, to, uh, about how to do that. But just to re remind you to cut the nails straight across, not to dig down the sides of the nails or poke anything down the sides of the nails and use a nail file if you're struggling to the, the height and the thickness of the, of the nail. Wear shoes that fit properly and Christian gave you quite a quite a comprehensive run through about footwear um, but wear shoes that fit properly both in and outside of the house. We don't encourage people to walk barefoot even if you think you have normal sensation. Um, we would encourage you to wear something on your feet even if you're indoors. Pay attention to your blood glucose control and Professor Edmonds mentioned this earlier on about neuropathy being caused by high blood sugars so anything that you can do to maintain an optimum blood glucose control will um, increase your uh, your um, foot health going forwards and always attend your attended diabetes checkups with your, whether that's with your diabetes nurse or your gp or your practice nurse to make sure that, that your wider diabetes um, status is, is well maintained and in those checks you'll well and it's important that you that you maintain um, a, a healthy schedule of, of diabetes checkups and always seek help quickly if you think you have a problem and again i refer you to that act now checklist that we talked through um, that that six points if you have any of those problems act now and, and get advice early thank you very much a quick whiz through so thank you so much, everybody. We're literally a, a minute or two over time. Just a final question. Are, are people with type 1 diabetes equally at, at risk? Um, and should they also have annual foot check results? Yes, uh, anybody with diabetes has a potential risk. But as we've heard uh, this evening, these risks can be managed and with good foot care and surveillance and management of all the other risk factors, then hopefully we can keep you all problem free. So I'd like to thank you all very much for, for joining us this evening. I hope you have found um, it helpful and uh, we'll thank you to all our panelists um, and good evening to you all thank you for coming thank you bye bye thank you Debbie. bye bye, thank bye you. take care everyone stay bye -bye. safe